morning. Hey, how's it going? Happy Friday. Good, same to you. Did you uh, finish Zelda? I'm stuck on Twilight Princess, and I'm getting really mad because I'm at the part where you have to escort Ilya and uh, the dead, like the injured um, Zoro, uh, like kid. And I'm on a carriage, and I'm getting. You have to hit down a like giant bird and fight off people on the horse, and I'm getting stuck when the bird drops a bomb. Huh. Yeah, escort missions in video games are uh, really hard to make fun. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to hear that, but once you get past that, it's smooth sailing to the end of the game, if I remember right, which I probably don't because I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Does my this looks weird, right? This looks like it's uh, bleached or something, like it's extra faded. I think it's because I have one more light on than usual when you turn off the ceiling light. That's better. That looks less uh, hyper white and bright. Uh, so let us go ahead and get started. Uh, today we have two items. Item one, a sub n is a sequence which is generated by the following function, 11 eighths plus one half n. What I would like y'all to do is please go across and write the first five terms of this. And then uh, also write the 23rd term of this. And then finally take this thing and rewrite it recursively. So just as a reminder, instead of writing it explicitly, which is what this form is, right? This allows us to plug in any n and get any answer. Rewrite it so that instead it generates the same set of numbers, but you're going to give what the first number is, and then you are going to give how you use that first number to then calculate the rest of the terms. Uh, and it's easy to check because if you plug in those digits, it should give you back the same first five. Oh, is that a wire? That's the wire to the webcam. Let me get rid of that. That's annoying in the frame. Um, and then item number two, make a conjecture, right? Conject about what generates the sequence. So all I mean by that is, you know, take a guess, give me an equation which writes it. You'll all probably get the same equation, right? But the reason why we don't use the word solve here is what? Why do you think we wouldn't use like the phrase solve for the equation which generates the sequence or whatever? You, you you can only make an equation you, like for this because you're not solving anything you're just trying to prove the statement yeah so solving makes the assumption that like hey you're going to show some algebras and then you're going to end up with your answer but that's not what's going on here you're actually using a much more difficult part of your brain to exercise not the algebra part but the part that looks for patterns and you're going to try and use that pattern to fit together an equation which produces this right now, uh, the reason why we can't say solve, additionally, is the fact that there are an infinite number of correct answers that all will give this sequence. But because of the like instructions and guidance that I gave you and the level of math that you guys understand now, uh, you'll probably all hit on basically the same equation or maybe one of two different answers. Uh, but for any given sequence, technically, there are an infinite number of ways to write it, depending on what you're willing to accept as a different equation. Because I think we can all agree that like x, whoop, sorry, whatever this function is, right, is exactly the same as what I'm about to write down here. Even though they like look different, is it fair that this second thing and this first thing are absolutely the same? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's because if I take and I do any transform and its inverse on that same object, uh, it's going to be equal, but it's going to appear different to us mathematically. Um, because of this fact, you could, you know, after you have an equation that works here, do any series of transforms and reverse transforms on it, and it'll still generate the same sequence, even though it like looks different. Uh, anyway, more detail than you need about the difference between giving a conjecture and giving a solution. Uh, also, just some like general announcements. 
Uh, today, I want to make sure that everybody is like super straight on uh, the OWS. I want to make sure that I have all the days that I need blocked off for AP testing uh, because I'm going to be real with you guys. I'm going to kind of disappear for the next few days. Um, I'm going to work on getting your guys' stuff graded and uploaded first today so that that's done and out of the way. And then I'm going to spend a bunch of time crunching away at the OWS so that it's done up through AP tests. But I have three more homework assignments due in the next two weeks to finish um, graduate school. And I have a comprehensive exam in six days. So next Thursday, I have to take a five-hour test um, in order to graduate. So I am going to get caught up on all the school stuff today. I want it all done and put away so that I can just focus on myself and my classes and whatever. So um, for AP tests, I believe you guys have AP US history and that's the Friday of week one. So we're not gonna have class on the Thursday or the Friday. On week two of AP tests, you guys have AP environmental science that next Monday. So that's blocked off. And then you're, you guys are AP language. So I also blocked off Tuesday and Wednesday of that week. Are there any AP tests that I'm missing? Nope, not That's at it. all. Okay, uh, perfect, thank you. Uh, also look out for your test scores. I should have those up today. I'm gonna try and crank that out in this afternoon. Um, uh, oh, announcement number two. Uh, I don't know if y'all saw, but LA County is doing sign up uh, COVID testing. Um, you just go onto the LA County website, sign up with the information, it's drive up, uh, roll up in a car, they swab the inside of your mouth, and then within three or four days, they get your results back. I'm gonna go get tested today. I was able to get a reservation for the Dodger Stadium testing location at, at two, and I'm mostly gonna go do it um, so that I can be a useful data point to people trying to track the spread of it through the city. Because I've been at a lot of major events, like right before the lockdown, I ran the marathon. I also went to that, like, a fat Bernie Sanders rally at the LA Convention Center. I also attend two different schools, right? One that I work at, uh, one that I attend college at. So because I was present in all those different populations in the lead up, if I test positive and am immune, that would probably be useful information to researchers, right? Uh, just letting y'all know. Well, if you caught it at those things, wouldn't it be over with by now for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it would be. What, what's the question? So how would you test positive if you don't have the virus? Oh, you don't. I mean, if you were to take a measles test right now, you would test positive for the measles uh, because you have, um, oh my God, what are they called? You have, oh my God, there's just like a technical term for it, but basically the way that like your immune system works is you become immune to a disease after you have it once because your immune uh, system stores a sample of that infection's genetic information, right? Um, and so what the test is looking for is it's actually looking for that genetic information within your immune system. I so. See. Yeah, if you have it, you get over the infection, then you become immune, you'll test positive for it forever until your body loses its immunity, which is why you, for certain vaccinations, you need booster shots or whatever, because certain immunities wear off over time. But um, yeah, if you had COVID as part of the LA outbreak and you either became immune and overcame it without having symptoms or whatever, uh, they should still be able to show that you had it in recent history because it'll show up in your immune system. Uh, other thing is, it's May 1st, man. How, like, wild is that? Um, uh, today is a holiday in some circles, but I would take the major guess that if you um, searched up the holiday that today is, because I tried it this morning. I always try it every year to see if it comes up. It didn't come up because, you know, this is America. Um, some parts of the world recognize May 1st as May Day. It's a commemoration of uh, a workers' rights protest, let's say, uh, a strike in Chicago called the Haymarket Affair, uh, which is actually like through an indirect chain of events what leads to the codification of the eight hour workday. Um, before there were regulations on like how long you could work, 
uh, whether or not children worked, all of that stuff was fought out by the workers' rights movement, right, by the labor movement. And all of those things were won slowly, one at a time. The 40-hour work week length so that there would be weekends that people didn't have to work, the eight-hour work day so that if you worked more than eight hours in a day, you would get additional pay for those additional hours past eight. And also, you know, not having children work in coal mines was also a thing won for us by the workers' rights movement. Uh, and it's wild to me that like May Day isn't recognized as such. Um, during like the anti-communist period in the 1950s, Eisenhower even declared it um, Loyalty Day to disassociate the day with its like roots in Chicago. Go figure. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. So item number one, uh, lots of stuff you're being asked to do here. So uh, what are our first five terms? Anybody? Is the first one 15 over eight? Yeah, and so, you know, it's just adding, right? It's 11 over eight plus one half. And here's a useful thing we can do for ourselves to make this uh, easier to count out. What's one half as a fraction out of eight? Four eighths. Yeah, four eighths. So every step we're adding four eighths to 11 eighths. So starting off with 11 eighths, which is in our first entry because our first entry goes with n is equal to one. This next step becomes 15 eighths. And then we'll just keep going along. So what else do we get? Adding four to the numerator each time. 17. Wait, Mr. Robinson, we're, um... Wait, if we plug in 2 to n, we get 2 over 2, that's 1, right? Or 8 over 8? Uh, um, so, okay. To get the next entry, yeah, you would multiply this by 2, so it becomes 1. And then you would add 8 over 8 to this. So what do we get here? Oh, 19. Oh, yeah, this yeah. is 19 over 8. Oh, yeah, but, same thing, yeah. Same but you thing. can Plus generate four. it from the previous yeah. term by adding this amount, because this is basically yeah, yeah. describing a linear increase. So what's our next value? Uh, 23. 23 over 8. And then? 27 over 8. 27. And then finally, element 5. 31, 31 over 8. Uh, and then we'll technically we'll give it a dot, 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 because it keeps on going, even though we're not going to write down the um, uh, values, right? It would take too long. And then item number two, let's go ahead and write the 23rd term. So how would we do that? We would have a sub what? How do we write that? A sub 23. Yep, it's a subscript that we want to represent. So that'll be 4s a sub 23. And then it's a matter of just plugging it in, right? So this will become 23 over 2, which is uh, going to be what out of 8? 103. Wait, no. I believe it'll, so. 92. This, yeah, it'll be 92. So this is 11 over 8 plus 1 half times 23, which is going to be equal to 11 over 8 plus 23 over 2, which is 11 over 8 plus 92 over 8, uh, which is going to tell us that a sub 23 is what? 103. 103 over 8. Okay, so that's the answer to our second part. And now finally, let's go ahead and write this recursively. Uh, and when we write stuff recursively, we have to give at least one value. So what's a fixed value that we know about now for this sequence? 11 over 8. So a sub 1 is equal to 11 divided by 8. And each time, each step that we take, how much are we adding to this? Plus, plus, four. Four. plus 4. Oh, and, plus and actually, four. also, I disagree with that. That's not our first entry. What's our first entry? 15 over 8 is a... A sub 1 is 15 over 8, and then after that, we give the instructions to generate the rest, which is to say any given entry, right, A sub n plus 1, if you want to make the next entry, wherever you're at, you want to go from n to n plus 1, it's going to be equal to that previous value, A sub n, and then what do we do to this? 
how big of a step are we taking every time? Four eighths. Four eighths or uh, one half. So the other way to describe a sequence is to do it recursively, which is to say, tell me how to make the next entry based on the last entry. And so the first entry in this sequence that I have defined as A is 15 eighths. And then to move along, we add one half, add one half, add one half, add one half. If you want the next piece in the sequence, you take the previous piece in the sequence and to that you add one half. Now, I think when it comes to sequence writing, this is easier to do. Like if I just gave you this set of numbers, it's easy to figure out, well, this is the first entry. And every time we're taking a step of one half, it's a lot harder to figure out this from that set of numbers to figure out what is actually the thing generating the sequence, right? It's hard, but not impossible. But what is the benefit of writing it explicitly as opposed to writing it recursively? And it has something to do with that. Yeah, you can just plug in the number. Yeah, so the value in writing it explicitly is that if you needed to know some, like one of the terms that is way far along in the sequence itself, um, then you could just plug it in. But if you wanted to get the 23rd term here, you would have to start at the first one and then add this amount 23 times, right? It would be a lot harder to figure out what the 10 millionth entry in the sequence is if you needed that information for some reason. Um, is that okay? Any questions there on item one? No, okay. So item number two, let's go ahead and conject about what generates this sequence. Uh, and I'll take either recursive or explicit because we're gonna answer it both ways. I'm sorry, what was the question? Item number two, I would like you to conject oh. about what function is generating the sequence. You can either tell me something recursive or something explicit. Oh boy. Let's go ahead and write it recursively first then. I think that's the um, easy one. So we'll start off by writing this recursively. What's uh, B1? Uh, four. B1 is four. And then what am I doing every time I move one forward in this sequence? You're dividing by negative two. Sure, I'm dividing by negative two, and I think uh, it's a little bit more, um, I, because of the way that math is written traditionally, people hate on dividing, so I'm going to say we're multiplying by negative half. So this is to say that if you want the next term in the series, if you want b sub n, you're going to do that by taking the previous term, I'm sorry, if you want the next term in the series, which is b sub n plus one, then you're gonna do that by taking the previous term in the series, b sub n, and you're gonna multiply it by one half. So this is the recursive way of writing this idea that we start off at four, and then if you wanna move forward to the next number based on the previous number, you take that previous number, you multiply it by half, negative half, and then that gives you the next number. So negative half, negative half, negative half, da 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 da. Now for the hard part, right? How do we write this explicitly? Is it um, negative one to the power of two times half? So uh, we definitely need the negative one to the power of n. Uh, why do we need that in here? Because it, it switches from positive to negative. Uh, yeah, each time. It, it blinks back and forth each time. And as we build this out piece by piece, and everybody listens carefully to the voiceover, because this is like where this logic comes from, is the first entry, number one, is this positive or is this negative? Positive. This is positive. However, if I were to plug in the number one here, right, this would tell me that my first entry is negative. So how can I fix that? No. No. Oh, so, two. Make it to two instead of one. N would be two instead of one. Yeah, uh, some even number, right? You could so do yeah. this one. That is the trick. We need to take it so that index one returns us an even exponent. 
So the easy way to fix that, right, because this is going to be negative on odd numbers, but we want this to be, I'm sorry, yeah, 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 this is going to be negative on odd numbers, but we want the opposite. We want it to be negative on even numbers. All we have to do is take n and add or subtract 1 to it. That will shift it over by 1. So now 1 plus 1 gives us 2. Oh. Negative 1 to the 2 gives us a, a positive number. Uh, that's the first trick I wanted you all to take away from this today. Uh, and then the next part, right, um, each time we're also multiplying by half. So how do I represent that in here? Every time I step forward through n's, we are multiplying by half again and again. So the first time I multiply by half, that's one half to the one. The second time I multiply by one half, that's one half to the two. The next time I multiply by one half, that's one half to the three. So what do I write? It's one half, but to the fourth. Uh, if you put it to the fourth, that would give you the fourth entry. If you put it to the fifth, that would give you the fifth entry. So what is the exponent on this? To the power n. of n. To the power of n. Every single time we're stepping up and we're multiplying by one half. Uh, and so every time we step forward through n, we multiply by that one half. And now finally, we need a constant out front so that it fixes our first value. So when we plug in our very first value, we get back four, right? So if I plug in one, one plus one is two, so this becomes positive one. And then this becomes uh, one half, this is still going to remain. So what does this constant need to be so that when I plug in one, B1 is four? What times one half will give us back four? Eight. And this right here is the simplest version, I believe, of an explicit equation that will generate this sequence. So here's where these bits and pieces come from. The one half, we're multiplying by this each step. That's how we know that it has to be that multiplier raised to the power of n so that as n goes up, we multiply by this with each one of those steps. We know that uh, it has to be negative one to the something because there's a sign change in each step. And then the whole point of the eight, the way that you figure that out, is that it must be eight in order to fix b sub one. So we know what that constant has to be, right? We know these are driving the pattern, but this first number ends up being four because this lead constant is eight. So if you took this and uh, at plugged in any n down the line, uh, you could get back what the value would be for this sequence. Um, are there any questions there? Uh, Ms. Robinson, um, can I confuse on why um, half n has to be um, an exponent and not just a not like a multiplier? So why is why do you have to put n as an exponent and not just half times n? Because those two functions do different things. If you were to say n times one half, then when you plug in one, you get one half. When you plug in two, you get two over two, which is one. When you plug in three, you get three over two, which is one and a half. So if you had n times one half, that thing is going to increase linearly with every single step. Oh, but yeah, that's not okay. what we're observing here. We're watching a decrease, which is actually exponential. Multiply by half, multiply by half, multiply by half. Oh. And so if you are multiplying by one half every step, explicitly, that's actually exponentiation. Okay, got it. I yeah, see. no, I mean, it's a really good question. It's actually a really complicated question that's hard to answer. And without already having gone through the exponential section, it would be really hard to see that. Um, Great. Okay. So uh, that's the end of the classwork for Friday. I already put it in the grade book, but let me put a spot for y'all to upload it on Classroom. And then we're gonna switch over to um, notes, which are, um, yeah, we're gonna switch over to the last part of notes for the section, and then we'll have the rest of this hour to work on that homework assignment. Uh, what week classwork is this? Is it six or seven? Six, six, okay. So week six, classwork. Upload classwork here. Uh, everybody hand all of your papers to one person at the group and then have that one person at the group bring it up to my basket. Oh, wait. Yeah, oops. <laughs>
uh, you know, I'm actually hella sad. I left that, you know, that, that document uh, organizer on my desk, the one with all the tears and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I am really sad that I left that thing at work instead of bringing it home because all of my notes for all of these classes are just kind of like in a file folder, poorly organized. I had the thought yesterday that if I brought that thing home, it would have been perfect for storing all these whiteboard notes. Um, anyway, uh, classwork assignment is up on Classroom. So as we transition over to these notes, uh, feel free to upload it. Though it's not due till 10 p.m., so there's no rush. I won't grade it until tomorrow. Just be sure to get it up before the end of the week. Um, so the last thing that I wanna talk about is a new mathematical symbol um, which you may not have seen before. I don't know. Some people see this in Algebra 2, some people don't. I forget what our sequence is. Uh, but let's just go ahead and start off. So this is just notes continued, and I kind of want to keep the punchline a secret until the final step. Yeah, so I'm, we'll come back to a title, but for right now, we'll just call this notes continued. So the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, this example, which leads to a new title. Let's go ahead and say that we have the following sequence, and this sequence is C, and this is going to be equal to three, three, six, uh, 18, and 72. So uh, let's start this off. I would like y'all to give me a conjecture about what exactly is generating this. So can we please do a conjecture uh, for the recursive form of this? So in order to do that, let's try and figure out what's happening here. Are we adding the same number every time? No. Um, we are not. Are we subtracting the same number every time? No. No. Are we? Hmm. We're not multiplying or dividing the same number each time either. Uh, we're not multiplying or dividing by the same number every time, but can we look for maybe a pattern in multiplication? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so as we go from step one to step two, and this is kind of a dead giveaway that this is the pattern, your first two digits are gonna repeat. Uh, what are we multiplying by from step one to step two? One. So this is uh, times one. And then what are we then multiplying in step two? two? Times and then two, here. And then times three. And then times three, and then. Uh, times four. Yeah, and then that next one is gonna be times four, right? So every single time we're multiplying by the next integer, what's another elegant way that we could say this? N. Yeah, each time we're actually multiplying then by N. And in every single step, N is increasing, 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 right? So this is to say that each time that we step up, we multiply by the new N. I'm sorry, we multiply by the previous n. So this is to say that uh, our next c, c sub n, is going to, sorry, c sub n plus one, our next c is going to be generated by the previous c, c sub n, then multiplied by n, right? So to go from one to two, I multiply by one. To go from uh, two to three, I multiply by two. To go from three to four, I multiply by three, blah, 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 all the way down, right? So this is it. Uh, and the only other thing that we need to establish a recursive way to establish this series is what? I'm sorry, sequence. What the else do we have starts. to define? Yeah, where it starts. And so it's this as long as C sub one is what number? Three. 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 C sub one is three. So this should generate this out forever. Is this okay? Yep. Here is where this gets odd, or I should say strange, since this is math. I don't mean like literally mathematically odd. How could we then write the explicit formula for this?
that's a lot harder, right? Uh, this is telling us that we need to multiply the first term by one, the second term by two, the third term by three and two and one, the fourth term by four and three and two and one. Are y'all aware of a function that will do that for us? Are y'all aware that there is a shorthand for 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one? Oh, um. What is that called and or how do we write the symbol for it? Isn't it um, Fib Fibonacci? Um, not or exactly. This... The Fibonacci sequence is a little bit different. If y'all don't know, there is actually a mathematical operation which does that exact thing and it's called the factorial. So n with an exclamation mark, which is what this is actually about, uh, this section is about the operation, the act of taking a factorial. And that is if you see a variable then chased by an, exp or an exclamation mark. So what this means is that if whenever you see n factorial, you are being asked to do the following, n times n minus one times n minus two times n minus three dot 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 all the way down until you multiply then by one. So this is to say that six factorial is equal to six times five times four times three times two times one, which we could do on our calculators. We could say six times five times four times three times two times one. And so six factorial is 720. Uh, however, because of the very, very common use of factorials in mathematics, uh, the TIE4 and all of your calculators will have uh, a factorial button on it. Um, yeah. Uh, because of how commonly used factorials are in building out definitions of statistical objects. So to get to your factorial button, sure. Oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, for those of y'all out there using TI-84s, under the probability menu, which is where factorials are most commonly used, it's right here, option four. So just to show that it gives back the same value, I'm going to use six math probability, go down to option four, which is that exclamation mark, the factorial, hit enter, and it gives back the exact same number, 720. So what a factorial does, right, when you take n factorial, you start at n, and multiply by all integers headed back to one. Um, is this okay? Have y'all seen the factorial function before? I, I have it. No. Yes, but I never knew what it did. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what that exclamation mark does. Here are some interesting factoids and one important property about um, factorials, and then I'll be done with notes for this section. Um, uh, number one, uh, this is one of the few functions that uh, you guys are aware of which can only take integers, only integer inputs. So that is to say that uh, 6.4 factorial is not well defined in terms of what that thing is doing, uh, simply because you are taking an integer and multiplying by all previous integers. So starting at the digit 6.4 is ambiguous. Uh, the second strange property about factorials is that if it's not obvious now, this is one of the few functions that you've been exposed to which uh, grows faster than exponentials. Like the first curve you see is uh, a parabola, and then you learn about exponentials, which somehow grow even faster than parabolas. This is one of the few operations that you can do on a variable that cause it to grow even faster than an exponential. That's because when you have an exponential, you're multiplying by the same number every single step as you move forward. 
in this case, as you multiply uh, by every single number moving forward, the number that you multiply by is getting bigger each step. And the last weird thing here is, uh, you guys remember what's e to the zero? A one, because anything to the zero is one. Yeah, anything raised to the zero itself is one, and you're just kind of asked to, um, I don't know, m memorize that, right? Uh, yeah. There's a proof to it, but it's an important factoid that you just need to know. Here's another weird factoid. Uh, zero factorial is equal to one. Uh, and again, this is not one that you can get by using the formal definition. This is just a factoid that you need to know. Uh, however, um, please accept the following proof of this idea. Uh, is it fair to say that, uh, well, n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, da 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 da, down forever, right? That's what the factorial operation is. So I can actually recollect everything after this first n right here, right? And I could actually rewrite everything that comes after that as n factorial is equal to n multiplied by n minus 1 factorial. So when you give the factorial instruction, you're saying take this number and multiply it by every smaller number. But that idea works in reverse. We could take the previous factorial. So if I had, for example, 5 factorial here, 5 factorial times 6 would then give me 6 factorial because it's 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, multiply by the next digit, and then that gives us 6 factorial. Is that okay? Kind of, yeah. Makes sense. Okay, so now I'm going to plug in the number 1. So at this step, pretend that n is equal to 1 so that we can test how this object behaves. 1 factorial is going to be equal to 1 times 1 minus 1 factorial. What's 1 factorial? Uh, 1. 1, because right? that's just saying yeah. take the number 1, multiply it by nothing, you're done, because the right. previous digits don't exist. 1 is equal to 1 times, what's 1 minus 1? 0. 0. 1 is equal to 1 times 0 factorial. And now I'll divide both sides by 1, divide both sides by 1, and 0 factorial must be equal to 1 for this factorial definition to behave correctly. This is a weird one. This is a lot like e to the 0 or how any number raised to the 0 returns you back 1. You can prove for weirdo reasons that this 0 factorial is 1, even if it doesn't necessarily match this original definition of the uh, factorial. Uh, anyway, uh, there will be a few factorial questions towards the end of the homework. Do your best on those. Um, though we won't get into the full power of why we care about factorials uh, until a much later section. Um, is this okay? Are there any questions yeah. here or are there any questions on the current homework? For those of y'all who have started, or if you haven't started, now would be a good time to start. I could talk a little bit about why we care about factorials. That might make it like easier to hold on to this stuff. But you should know that like, if I do, the thing that I'm about to talk about uh, is an idea from the second half of the chapter, so probably even post AP test. So here's an idea that we'll come back to later. I'm gonna just talk about one straightforward example. Um, unless there are questions. Are there any questions out there? And probably nobody started the homework because it's not due till Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, I figured. Here's why we care about factorials. Here's a case in which they are clearly useful to us. Let's say that you are playing a card game which does not exist, right? And the only reason why I'm gonna say that it's a card game that doesn't exist is so that I can keep these rules hella simple so that they're easy to understand. Uh, we're playing a game where we shuffle a deck of cards, and if you don't know, there are 52 cards in a deck, right? Uh, and I wanna know, what is the chance that I shuffle a deck of cards, and it's a fair shuffle, right? 
and then I deal you four cards in a row. You're the only player. And if I deal you all four aces, you win a million dollars. So here's the rule of the game. Um, shuffle a deck. Deal the top four. And if you get four aces, you win. One million dollars. What's the chance that you win? It's like seven and a half percent or something, right? If it was seven and a half percent, you would be stupid to not play this game. If you had a seven percent chance of winning a million dollars, you should bet so much or, money on no, that, yeah, you yeah. should just drain your bank account until you win. Because <laughs> that means every hundred times you play, you'll win seven times. So if yeah, you play a hundred times, mistake. you'll win seven million dollars. Oh no, it's fine. Don't get me wrong. You, I go off on that extreme tangent because most adults understand and interpret percentage and probability wrong. I just want to make sure that that's not the case in this classroom. What's the chance, and let's, and here's how we're going to learn how to do probability. What's the chance that you draw one card and it's an ace? How many aces are in a deck? There's four. When you start off, there are four aces in a deck of cards, and there are 52 cards. So if I have all 52 cards in the deck and it's been shuffled, the chance that you get an ace on your first card, so one ace, it's going to be uh, four in 52. Now, in order for you to win, like I said, you need all four, right? So we're right. going to assume that after you have been dealt that first ace, right, that what is the chance that the next card is also an ace? So if you got an ace on the first card, how many aces are left? There's three. So it'd be three out of three to 52, your next probability. But if you got delta ace. card, you got oh, delta so card, 51. though. So how many cards are in the deck? There's 51. Correct. So there are 51 cards in the deck. And then you want to get delta third ace. How many aces are left? So it'd be two to 50. And then can you simplify that or you just leave it like that? 250. Like, you should leave it like that, and we'll see why for obvious reasons in a second, right? And then finally, you have three of the four aces in your hand. Uh, what is the chance that you get that fourth and final ace and you become a millionaire? One to 49. One in 49. And the way that probabilities work is if you want to combine a series of independent events, you multiply straight across. So the chance of getting heads on one coin toss is one half. The chance of getting two heads in a row is one half times one half, which is one fourth. And so if you want to calculate the probability here with this stuff, that numerator is what? Uh, 24, four times. But what is that? Four times three oh, times two I times forget. one? We just learned a new way to write four times three times two times Good. one. Four factorial? Or four factorial. Five, four. Very good. Yeah. That numerator is four factorial. And the bottom is 52 times 51 times 50 times 49. So 52 factorial. It would be, if it was 52 factorial, it would blow up your calculator because it's going to be 52 times uh 51 times 50 times 49 times 48 times 47 times 46 times da, 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 all the way down and i think that number is so big that your calculator probably can't even process it i think if we ask your calculator for 52 factorial it'll die oh it can do it it's got 67 zeros but it's not that Jeez. hard to get yeah uh factorialized values are crazy big they're way bigger than exponentiated values uh but so if i go over here to this will this kill it and it's dead it is so many digits that it overwhelms your calculator's ram how about that nice. uh yeah I, I guess um and so a way that we could write this would actually be 52 factorial because that will um multiply by 50 times 52 times 50 times 49 
And then the way that we would negate out the rest of them is by dividing this then by 48 factorial. So this is the same as the instruction, 52 times 51 times 50 times 49, but divide out 48 and all of the digits that come afterwards. And so when it comes to these compli or complicated uh, probability questions, we can take what we're actually doing here mathematically and we can rewrite it explicitly as a factorialized outcome. Uh, and so this is a good way to rewrite the probability of getting four aces in a row. Or if you just wanna see what this is and how freaking unlikely this would be, four times three times two times one divided by 52 times 51 times 50 times 49. Uh, that is 3.7 times 10 to the negative six. This is the uh, probability that this occurs as a decimal. So, hey, kids who paid attention in science, what is this? What is 10 to the negative six? What is that asking me to do to this decimal? Move it six times to the left. Let's move it one and two and three and four and five and six. So this is to say that your probability of winning is 0 0.12345. Three, seven. So this is your probability as a decimal. Or if you want to turn this into a percent, the percent chance that you win will be this number multiplied by 100, which will move this back over to decimal places. So it's 0.00037% chance of winning. Uh, it's not a game I would play. Definitely um, not 7%. Yeah, definitely not 7%. Yeah, you'd have to play a lot more games than just... Uh, If you, if you had a 7% chance of winning a game, you would win every time you played 14 games. Uh, yeah, that's definitely not the case here. You'd probably never win. You'd probably run out of money first. Um, anyway, uh, that's all I have to talk about today. That was a little bit more than I in, in, had intended upon. Uh, but do your best with the homework. I figure there will still be questions on Monday uh, based on whatever you have left over from the weekend. So, you know, do your best. Uh, and I'll just move the due date to Monday so that you can ask those questions on Monday and get uh, a chance to get them answered before it's due. You all have a very nice weekend, and I'll see you Monday. See you, Mr. Robinson. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a good weekend. You too.